What's the difference between a G5 RV and a doublet? Question I was asked recently. Well, it's an interesting question. What is the difference between a G5 RV and a doublet? Louis Varney designed the G5RV antenna some 75 years ago. But even today, it's still very, very popular. It stood the test of time. To answer the opening question, the G5RV is simply a doublet, but with special features. So let's take a look at how it all started and why I believe that Louis Varney designed this antenna. Louis Varney was born in London in 1911 and he attended the Hendon Secondary School. He was obviously interested in electronics and electricity because at the tender age of 16 he obtained his artificial aerial licence to ARV. Now this was the way into ham radio in those early days. So what was an artificial aerial licence? Well basically you had to demonstrate to the licensing authority, which was the General Post Office then, the General Post Office were the licensing authority, and you had to demonstrate to them that you could actually build and operate a transmitter safely. And so basically what you did, you built your transmitter, and bear in mind in those days, radio was in its early stages, and you couldn't go down to the local shop and necessarily buy the components you, you wanted, you had to make this and that, you make your own coils and sometimes make your own capacitors. So it was quite a challenge, but if you got your artificial aerial license, you were then, then allowed to build a transmitter and transmit into a dummy load. Well, in those days, the classic dummy load was none, none other than the ordinary electric light bulb. That was the popular way of creating a dummy load. And in fact, in my early days of ham radio, I used exactly that. You wanted a dummy load, just got an electric light bulb and you normally had a sort of a Pi network in the output of the transmitter and you could get a rough idea of how much power was coming out because if you had a 50 watt light bulb or 100 watt light bulb and it glowed pretty brightly the same as when you plugged into the mains and you were probably getting 100 watts out um, but uh, uh, I remember that I had to sort of ferret around trying to find a 25 watt light bulb I think it was in order to get any power but anyway you were under this these these uh, artif the artificial aerial um, license you were able to build a transmitter. Now, it would seem that if you were that interested in ham radio, you weren't going to be very happy just fiddling around with a transmitter into a dummy load. And I suspect quite a few of them actually connected an antenna, even though they didn't have the license then, and communicated with one another. I know that um, uh, Louis Varney's great friend was Jack Hum, who later became G5UM, and I think uh, Jack Hum was the original editor of Practical Wireless. I think I'm right there. Anyway, I suspect that they actually did communicate. Anyway, after a year, you were then allowed to transmit and connect your transmitter to an aerial. And as a, as a consequence of that, you were given a G call sign, and you, in the case of uh, Louis Vine, it was G5RV. So he was licensed as G5RV at the age of 19. And that's when his serious ham radio career began. And he also started an apprenticeship in electronics. Now, as soon as you were issued with a G call sign, in this case, a G5RV, you had to transmit CW for a year. In other words, you couldn't operate phone for a year. Once you'd served that apprenticeship, you were allowed to go onto phone. And I guess that Louis experimented like um, many of us did subsequently with different types of aerials and different transmitters. And obviously you had to have a receiver. No idea what he was actually using in that time, but I'm sure that uh, he was pretty busy. But of course, uh, the war broke out and then Louis was conscri conscripted into the army. And I think he rose to the uh, um, level of a second lieutenant and he was involved in radio communication, and in particular DF development. And then when the war ended, um, Louis went back to Marconi where he rose to, I think he was second in charge on the technical side. And that's really when he came on the scene with his antenna. The actual design of the antenna was created by Louis in 1946 
although it didn't actually appear in print, or at least uh, in the RSGB bulletin, until 1958. But I would imagine uh, prior to that the antenna became fairly popular because he would have been talking about it on the air and so forth. And uh, in those days uh, everything was uh, word of mouth. And of course he was a member of the Chelmsford Amateur Radio Club. So uh, they would have, and that was quite a, well it still is, quite an active club. So they would have been chatting about it and uh, word of mouth etc etc. And it was a multi-band wire antenna. The good thing about the G5RV at the time was that it was simple to construct. All you needed was some wire, and uh, you could you could you could make it. So that was the attraction of the uh, of the antenna in those days. And of course, the attraction has continued ever since, particularly in certain places around the world where you can't get um, a lot of materials. Provided you get some wire, you can probably make yourself a G5RV multiband antenna. Now you have to remember that in 1948. We didn't have the 15 meter band and we didn't have the walk bands. So the primary bands were 160 meters, 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, and 10 meters. And I've been doing a bit of ferreting around and I found a call book that shows the original address of Louis Varney. He was in Chelmsford, and in fact, he wasn't too far away from where I used to live. Uh, he was only about 10 miles away, and I do recall. I'm hearing him on the air. He was always primarily a CW operator. So I found his address and I've now looked on Google Map because the house is still there. And I'll show you now on the screen the, um, the aerial shot of his house. It's quite interesting actually for a couple of reasons. Now here you see the garden. I assume that the plot hasn't changed. North is at the top and from top to bottom the dimension would you believe is 102 foot. And from left to right, in other words, east-west, the dimension's approximately 110 feet. So he wouldn't have been able to install um, uh, a full-size 80-metre uh, dipole if he wanted to, but it was a perfect garden for a 102-foot antenna, and I have no idea which direction he ran it in. Now here's a drawing of the antenna as it appeared in the RSGB bullet in 1958. I'm sorry that it's not a very clear picture. I'm trying to get a, an original copy of the magazine, but so far I haven't been able to. Anyway, it serves the purpose here. We've got a 102 foot top, 51 foot either side of center. Then we've got this 34 foot of ladder line. Now he used 600 ohm, but of course 450 ohm ladder line would be uh, fine without changing the dimensions. Then he recommends either 72 ohm twin feeder or 72 ohm coax. Now, of course, in those days, 72 ohm coax would have been the popular choice um, and probably give a better match than the now very popular and standard 50 ohm coax. Now, on the right hand side of this drawing, you will see that he suggests that that twin feeder or coax goes back either directly to the transmitter or to the antenna matching unit. Now, bear in mind, in those days, all transmitters had Pi networks, and most of them did. And a Pi network would handle all sorts of reactances, so it probably wouldn't have no problem in matching whatever it saw in terms of reactance from the G5RV at the end of the feeder. But then further down in the same article, he shows an alternative method of feeding it, and that is using ladder line all the way back to an antenna matching unit. And... I wonder whether that is the preferred method that Louis Varney used when he was erecting and experimenting with this particular antenna. There's no mention of a ballon, and in fact I don't think they even existed in those days. The antenna is optimised for the 20 metre band. The top section is three half waves in phase, and that provided an impedance at the centre of around about 100 ohms. The ladder line is a half wave on 20 metres, so that 100 ohms at the top is repeated at the bottom of the feeder. And that, of course, provides a fairly good match for 72 ohm coax. And clearly, 50 ohm coax is further away, so you're not going to get such a good match as Louis would have had with 72 ohm coax. So I think it would be interesting now to look at the polar diagrams of the bands uh, 80, 40, 20 
15 and 10 meters. They would have been the bands that Louis would have operated the antenna on. So let's take a look at the polar diagrams for each band. On 80 meters, you get a typical donut pattern with dipole, it's slightly squashed. And of course the antenna is slightly shorter. What actually happens is that uh, the center part of the antenna is folded down and forms part of the balance line. The efficiency is pretty good with such an arrangement, I would say is no less, no, no more loss than about a, a dB. And the impedance will be a medium impedance, so I guess that uh, if you had a 4 to 1 ballon there, um, you'd get a, a, a pretty good match on 80 metres. Still get some SWR, but it wouldn't be horrendous. On 40 metres, it's a 3 quarter wave length antenna, and it's typical dipole radiation pattern, perhaps slightly more acute. And because of the length of the matching section, the 30, 34 foot of ladder line, once again, you'll get a medium impedance, so it's not too difficult impedance to, to match. Now we come to the most interesting band, 20 meters. This is where the antenna is optimized. It's three half waves in phase, and it gives a very good match at the center. The center fee point is low impedance, and so is the impedance at the bottom of that 34 foot ladder line. So you could match that very easily, even with 50 ohm coax. It's interesting to see how the pattern has now broken up into something which is very, very interesting because it gives you directions from a dipole that you wouldn't normally get. Um, if you compare the radiation pattern from 80 meters and 40 meters, which is typical dipole, this one gives you um, a radiation in directions which you wouldn't normally um, find you get from the dipole and a little bit of gain as well. So it's, it's quite an interesting um, radiation pattern. And of course, if you actually erect this antenna at what was recommended 30 foot, uh, 34 foot high, that's halfway above ground, then you get some reasonably good low angle radiation as well. So it's a great DX antenna for 20 meters. Now, when we come to 15 meters, you really do need an antenna matching unit because there's a quite a high impedance, high reactance at the fee point. And without an antenna tuner, you're not really going to be able to match it. So even if you have coax going back to your transmitter or transceiver, you probably find that even the built-in AT you won't, uh, won't cope with it. And of course, bear in mind that when Louis Varney designed this antenna, the 15 meter band didn't exist. And finally, we come to the 10 meter band, which is a radiation pattern very similar to the 20 meter pattern. But it's not so easy to match. Um, it would be a bit of a challenge and uh, almost certainly you'd probably need an antenna tuner unit. It's a bit of a suck and see situation. Depends on what the, the capability of the antenna tuner is. Certainly an external tuner would match it, but um, the internal antenna tuners on your transceiver might well struggle. So, what about the walk bands? Well, on 30 metres and 17 metres, you are likely to require an external antenna tuner. On 12 metres, it's not so bad. You may well find your internal antenna matching units in your transceiver will cope. So you see, basically, the G5RV is an antenna that will work on some bands with an internal antenna tuner, but not on other bands. And to some extent, it depends on the installation. It depends on the length of the coax. And the simple reason for that is that depending on the frequency of operation and the length of coax you've got from that ladder line back to your transceiver, determines the reactive components that the transceiver sees or the matching unit sees. And sometimes, simply by adjusting the length of the coax, you'll get a better match on one band than another. But it swings and roundabouts. You, you, you find that on one band you can't get a match, you, you adjust the length of the coax and then it throws it out on another band. So basically, it's unlikely that you'll be able to install a G5RV and run coax cable from that stub back to your transceiver and work on all bands. It's not possible. And that really is where
the G5RV stands in terms of how uh, multiband it actually is. Oh, one thing I would suggest, of course, is that do install a line isolator at the point where the coax goes into your transceiver. That's very important because the common mode currents that flow on the outside of the coax will greatly influence your transceiver's ability to match the, the uh, antenna. So do insert a line isolator. So we've seen that one of the problems with the G5RV is a matching problem. There's no doubt that the antenna works. I mean, I have seen comments, <clears throat> I have seen comments where saying that, you know, does the G5RV really work? Is it, uh, is it a, a dummy load? Well, it's, you know, they're, they're really, um, really silly comments to make. Basically, the G5RV is a sound antenna. It's the matching that is the problem. And if you want to feed your uh, antenna with coax cable, you would normally have to invest in an external antenna tuner for some of the bands. But there have been a number of attempts to actually modify the G5V. There's been a lot of work, um, and rather interesting work actually, in modifying the G5RV uh, by changing the dimensions of the top section slightly and also of the ladder line in order to try and make it more friendly, if you like, and uh, to, to reduce the VSWR on some of the bands and make it more um, a, a general antenna that covers all the bands and can be fed with coax cable. That really is, is the ideal situation. A wire antenna that covers all bands and can be fed successfully with coax cable, even if you like to uh, sort of have to tweak it slightly on uh, uh, the internal antenna tuner. But all these modifications have never really successfully match the antenna on all bands. They've improved things, but they haven't actually managed to give you what you really want, which is a nice low VSWR with low loss on the feeder line and so forth. And that brings me to ask, is that really the right way of feeding the G5RV antenna? Let's now go back to Louis Varney's original article in the RSGB Bulletin in 1958. Quite clearly, he shows an option of feeding that G5RV with ladder line all the way back to the antenna matching unit in the shack. I suspect that's the way that Louis Varney actually ran his G5RV. You know, with a doublet, the advantage of a doublet is it can be made very agile. And really and truly, the big adjustment you make to a doublet is in the top section, which determines the polar diagram. And you've seen when I showed you the various bands that the polar diagram changes. The good thing about a doublet is you decide how long it's going to be. And that's determined by two things. First of all, how big a garden is. And secondly, what sort of polar diagram you want on each band. And we've seen that particularly on 20 meters, instead of getting the traditional um, broadside radiation pattern, we start to get lobes at directions at a more acute angle of the, not of the end, but at angles that you don't normally get from a conventional dipole because on 20 meters you've got three halfways in phase. So Louis Varney really realized that. I think 20 meters was his favorite band. Uh, it was great for DX. And he, I'm sure, fed it with ladder line all the way back to the matching unit. He was an engineer, he was a fully qualified engineer with years of experience. Why would he have wanted to suddenly switch from ladder line to coax or twin feeder, albeit at 72 ohms? I think the reason he showed that was because he thought people would want that as an option. I don't for one minute think that Louis Varney fed his five RV in that manner. I think he had ladder line all the way back to the matching unit in the shack. That would achieve two things, very, very low loss and very easy to switch from band to band. And of course, if we use that method, then we have no problem with the warp bands either. The G5RV 
works extremely well. It's not, as some people said, a, a dummy load or it doesn't work extremely well. It, it's, it's a doublet. The G5 B is a doublet, pure and simple. It's a doublet of dimensions that Louis Varney wanted in order to get DX on 20 metres and enable him to operate on all bands from 80 metres to 10 metres. And you saw in the uh, um, picture I showed that his garden was 100 foot. Square, actually, lucky, lucky fellow. Now, one other thing I will tell you is that you can reduce the dimensions of a G5RV. If you dropped the end sections vertically, you say, say the end section is 10 or even 15 feet vertically, that really doesn't change the polar diagram at all. The polar diagram is determined by the first sort of half of the antenna or a bit more, say two thirds of the antenna. That's the bit that determines the polar diagram. So the end bits simply bring it to resonance. So if you've got a smaller garden, don't be frightened of dropping those vertical sections down by 10 or even 15 feet. Then you might even get a full size G5 RV in your garden. And if not, then look at the half size 5 RV. It's a great antenna. It's stood the test of time. It's had some criticism and it's had a lot of work done in it. But at the end of the day, I suspect Louis Varney had ladder line all the way back to the shack and he was very happy with the operation of that antenna, particularly on 20 metres. And it also enabled him to operate on the other bands. And finally, a couple of interesting points that Louis made in his article in 1958 in the RSGB Bulletin. First of all, he pointed out that because of the length of the antenna on 20 metres, the dipole actually had a lower angle of radiation than a conventional 20 metre dipole because of the length. So the angle of radiation was slightly lower. That would have helped with DX. But the more interesting point I suppose he made was if you do use coax, don't use a ballon at the bottom of the feeder. In other words, where the balance line goes to the coax. He said that he found that that wasn't necessary, the currents were balanced, and that a ballon was likely to degrade the performance because there were some high VSWRs on some bands and there would be increased losses in the ferrite material because of heating, etc, etc. Rather interesting point. So, um, if you're going to use coax cable, don't use a ballon at the junction between the coax and the balance line but you will need some sort of matching um, at the end of the coax on uh, a number of the bands. As I said uh, several times in the video here, um, the internal ATU may match the 5RV on some bands, but it won't match it on all bands by any means. But uh, there we are. That's uh, some advice from the designer of the G5RV. So that's the result of my investigation of the G5 RV and reading various things and looking at the bulletin and uh, assessing how Louis Varney would have probably operated his antenna. Whatever view you have, you can't deny the fact that the G5 RV antenna has stood the test of time. It's something like 75 years since Louis Varney designed that antenna and it's still in use today around the world. The call sign G5RV is probably one of the most famous call signs in the world. And I think that uh, Louis Varney deserves credit for producing an antenna that has stood the test of time. There's not many people that can claim that. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it's been a help to you. I'm sure that so many of you will have different views on the antenna and so forth, but uh, that's my view. Take care, enjoy your ham radio. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.